Okay. So welcome students and um, everyone attending today. Thank you for joining us for another History's Calling, Where Will It Take You? We love these events and we hope you guys are getting some great ideas as you're watching this webinar series for inspiration of what your post-graduation might look like someday. So please take some time if you haven't yet to go to our website, history.byu.edu slash webinar dash series. And there you'll be able to see all of our past webinars and also see that soon we'll be posting pre-recorded webinars for you guys to watch to get more ideas on um, different people, and their career paths and where they have taken them and get some ideas and inspiration from that. Um, we'll continue, however, to have our live webinar series held every first Thursday of the month at 11 a.m. So join us here for that every month for the live ones. Um, we also just really quick before we jump into this one and we'll make one quick announcement um, to let you know of our history internship, history and family internship and career fair, which is taking place this next Tuesday, February 9th from 1 to 4. And this is over Handshake and we already have quite a few um, employers signed up to come to this. So please take advantage of this and come and get ideas on internships and um, jobs that are available right now for all the history and family history students. Um, I included that link for you in the chat as yes. well. Yep, so we just posted that in the, in the chat. If you guys wanna get on there and register while you're watching today, you can do that as well. We'll be glad you did. Yes, it's gonna be a great experience and um, lots, of, lots of great companies coming already. You can get on and check out who's already coming. Um, so now, on to what you've all come here for today, on to um, visit with Dr. Greg Jackson. We are so excited to hear from him and get to learn a little bit more about his academic and career path and kind of how that path has taken him to where he is now. Um, Dr. Greg Jackson is best known for being the creator, host, and head writer of the U.S. podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. He also served as a historical consultant to the podcast American Elections Wicked Game, has made numerous media appearances, has authored various academic articles and op-eds. Greg is Assistant Professor of Integrated Studies and Assistant Director of National Security Studies at Utah Valley University, where he teaches courses spanning U.S., European, and Middle Eastern history and current events. Greg earned his PhD history from the University of Utah, and holds an MA in French Studies and a BA History from Brigham Young University. So welcome, Dr. Jackson. Thank you very much. So um, like we said, after our discussion today, we're gonna have a Q&A. So if everyone wants to use the Q&A feature here, um, as Dr. Jackson talks, you guys can um, have those questions ready and then Lindsay will help fill those questions at the end to you, Dr. Jackson. Okay, okay so to start off today, um, we would love you just to tell us a little bit about your journey. Tell us a little bit about the path that you took, how you decided to study what you did, challenges that you had along the way, and kind of how you got to where you are now. Sure. Uh, let me sum that up uh, in, in just a few minutes. <laughs> I, always loved, I always loved history. It was the one subject that kept my attention in, in high school. I was not a, a good student uh, in high school. I was far more interested in my garage band, uh, which we did get outside the garage. I'm going to go ahead and point that out. We played some illustrious dives in uh, LA and Orange County. Ooh. And, uh, what's that? That sounds exciting. It was. it was. It was a blast. But the one class that always captured my attention was history. I just innately really enjoy seeing how things got to be where they're, where they're at today, seeing the connections and and sometimes the very uh, odd things that can happen. So I knew going in, I wasn't someone who changed my major. I, I knew that after I uh, had uh, made recompense at a community college and then transferred to BYU, uh, I, I knew that I wanted to be a history major. That, that was never a question. In terms of landing where I did with my career, I mean, I, I had plenty of pressure from friends and family who let me know that no one with a history degree ever, you know, gets a job. Uh, that, that nothing would work out for me. I definitely needed to be a business major, that everything would be better if I do that. And I, I pushed against that. Uh, I was fortunate enough, we were talking a little bit before we officially started about my cohort at, at BYU. 
I think I benefited from happening to be in a group and perhaps this is every cohort at, at BYU in history, but very sharp students that helped, you know, we, we sharpened each other, right? We were always in friendly competition with one another. And, and that kept us you know, moving along. All of us would do extras. So we didn't just show up and get our degree. We were involved in Phi Alpha Theta. We were publishing our student papers. We were eager to uh, be research and teaching assistants. Uh, Eric Dursteller, I know is still there. I, I worked for him more semesters than I can count. So that all helped me when it came time to apply to graduate school. Again, of course, as I made those applications, I was informed how I would never get a job and uh, I plowed ahead anyway. And I would say one of the most important things that I did though is uh, it wasn't uh, going to the snootiest institution that could possibly accept me. Uh, and I don't say that to be smirched the University of Utah. It's got plenty of snoot to it, but I, I networked. And I, I think that that's something some humanity social science students can sometimes look down their nose at and feel like, oh, that's what those, uh, those dirty business majors do. But I, I kind of do it naturally. I'm a very people person I, type of individual. I enjoy talking to people and getting to know their story. And uh, that really helped me get my foot in the door in different places. Um, I would mention interviews I had with other institutions to the other institutions with which I was interviewing to help leverage. So negotiation was an important factor. And these are all things students need to be aware of. It ultimately, that enabled me to land at Utah Valley University and in integrated studies. Um, and then in terms of history that doesn't suck, which I would say has been the most distinguishing, different set apart aspect of my career. Uh, that was born of seeing what, what I perceived as a massive hole in what, it, in a real, a real need in society and this podcasting genre where I saw a lot of entertaining history podcasts done by intelligent and capable, but nonetheless amateurs, people who lacked the training of a historian. And there are just some things that they're missing, period. Meanwhile, there was plenty of dry stuff by people like myself who've been trained to write esoteric articles that frankly, no one who's looking to fill their commute wants to listen to. And similarly, we tend to write articles and books like that. No offense to my colleagues who are watching this right now. And for me, I, I felt like there was a way to bring these two worlds together. And that's what I endeavored to do. Uh, and, and then as I launched History That Doesn't Suck, there was, again, a lot of networking. I would go on any other podcast that would have me on. I would email other podcasts and ask if they'd be interested in having me on as a guest. Because any, any additional audience I could get in front of, it didn't matter if they had 10 listeners, two of them might come and join mine. And that, uh, along with going to, to conferences, you know, cobbled together until it hit its own a viral level where the, the listeners themselves are, are sharing it at such a number that it's trended to being uh, among the most popular history podcasts in the nation. I think I did that with some brevity. Is that all right? How did you decide um, what, so once you were a professor, after you were a professor, you decided to start doing your podcast? Yeah. Right. Yes. So how did you decide that you, that this was something you wanted to do? I know you said that you know, you were lit, there wasn't really anything out there that you were interested in, but how did you think, okay, I can make this happen? And how did you decide to get that running? And what challenges kind of come with making something like that happen and be successful? <laughs> the, the, cha the challenges are almost infinite. So part of it was getting to know myself. And I think that's an important, um, something important for every student to do is they're trying to figure out their, their career. I came to uh, realize that I am a bit, I'm a bit more of a people person than a lot of historians. I, and again, I'm not trying to put anyone down in the profession, but you know, I'm, I just, I have a bit of personality. It comes across in the classroom. I always had very, very strong student evaluations and my skill set. I, I guess, I, I don't know that I'm necessarily going to write the seminal work on some niche aspect of history but I have an ability to make complicated things very easy and palatable. And that ability to articulate things in a very, at times intentionally colloquial way, um, that was really helping me in the classroom. And I, I thought to myself, people at large need to have a better understanding of a lot of historical issues. And 
I don't think that we in academia are intentionally trying to be up in our ivory towers, excluding the public, but whether we mean to or not, we can do that. Uh, I think we're, we're more prone to that. Most of us are more prone to it than not, even though I can think of a number of other excellent historians, some of whom are great friends, that make a real effort to publish in more popular journals like The Atlantic or you know, what have you and trying to engage with the public. So I was drawn to that partly because I found that more fulfilling than, um, I mean, I still write my, my esoteric articles too, don't get me wrong, but I found that a lot more fulfilling, the idea of, of trying to reach the public and, and build real basic understandings of, of US history. I knew that I had the right skill set for it. And then I was, in, I was encouraged by, um, <laughs> I was on a flight and I happened to sit next to a TV producer and uh, he was he was doing one of the the New York LA bits. I was going to a conference in in Scotland. We happened to be on the same leg going to New York. We got talking, uh, you know, about what overlaps we had. Uh, his son broke the ice by kind of being in my space, which I didn't care about. But you know, I come from a Mormon background. I I come from a huge family. I love kids. He was terrified that his son had, you know, upset the the, the guy in a tie. At any rate, uh, as that ice broke and we got talking and I mentioned, um, you know, the closest thing I had, I'm just looking for common ground, right? As, as you do in, in these sorts of conversations that I, I go on ABC4 here in Utah uh, fairly frequently to talk about uh, current events and uh, issues facing national security. He, I, I, I remember this moment here, he, he kind of, this light almost kind of went on his head and he looked at me and he said, they keep asking you back, you must be good at it. And I kind of thought, I've actually never thought about that before, why they keep having me back. Uh, and then he, he kind of said, you know, we need more people who have your skill set, your abilities to engage with the public. And he, incur he encouraged me and basically said, you know, you should try launching a podcast, you know, some, something in that realm. And the idea just stuck with me. And as I was sharing my paper at this conference in Scotland, it was just marinating in the back of my head. And when I got home, this was the summer of 2017, I got back, I started thinking through what would that look like? And that's how we got there. Wow, that's, that's a great, that's a great way to be able to get into that. And I have to say, I really personally appreciate that because I love studying history in that kind of way where it is kind of laid out. And I've listened to some of your podcasts where it does just kind of bring it all together. It's nice to let somebody else go out there and do all of that research and work and then put it all together for you and just like you know this is basically how it happened so I love that bridge that you as a historian have bridged over to people who just they want to learn history but they don't aren't in the academia side of it and able to do that so that's wonderful I want to talk a little more about your podcast but I want to jump back a little bit too and just go back to the beginning when you were talking about your process of getting to where you are you mentioned a couple of times of some of the, the flack that you might have received from people who, you know, talked to you about choosing to study history and whatnot. And what could you say maybe to our history students right now about um, students who also maybe face that same question of, you know, you should be studying business maybe or something more like that. What do you say to students like that, how to get over that and to stick to what they really love? Well, I, I say, first of all, that you, you just as with any intellectual debate, you've got to acknowledge the strengths of your opponent's argument. And the fact is that you do not see want advertisements on LinkedIn for historian, $60,000 a year, you know, benefits, please just come and write the history of our corporation. That's not really a thing. That said, the skills that come with a history degree are, uh, are, are vital and crucial. Uh, the uh, ability to think, and I'm saying things that you've all heard before, being able to think and being able to write well, these are very valuable skills. Um, the, the key thing I think though, that is gonna set apart from what they've already heard, right? That's a pretty canned deal. Great, the liberal arts are important, congratulations. We have a million articles talking about that. If they can talk about things they are doing to make that degree more attractive to future employers, you're gonna be able to get mom and dad to calm down a little bit. So what internships are you doing? What papers have you published? Because when you publish a paper, that shows an employer that not only should they actually read your writing sample, but someone else has already thought that you're a good writer. 
I mentioned networking. Academia loves to think that it's entirely off of merit and that's a lie. Networking was an important part. It's, it's not that I'm not skilled and capable enough to do my job, but there are a lot of skilled and capable people without jobs. And networking is an important part of it, getting yourself you know, in, in front of people. So if you will go and take your history degree and, network and, and do internships with the sorts of companies where you wanna work, think about where you wanna be. Do you actually wanna be in the business world? You just want that liberal arts background, which is great. That's where most of the CEOs on Fortune 500 lists, they come from. And it's not to say that if you do a history major, you're gonna be a Fortune you know, 500 CEO. No, but the better students, the really capable ones, they're gonna be able to take those very lateral broad thinking skills, take them to the business world, and they're gonna do things that the, the canned MBA just isn't going to see. They're not gonna connect the dots on. So you know, don't, don't look at internships that aren't related to history and think, oh, I can't do those. Uh, and in fact, here, here I will pick on a little bit my own, my people, my fellow historians. I, <clears throat> I think academic historians, we sometimes have zero experience outside of academia. We did a bachelor's, a master's, a PhD. We stayed in academia our entire career. And then we turn around and we tell our students, you know, there are a lot of jobs in history outside of academia. And I just like to ask them when they say that, can you name one that you've done? Can you even name five jobs that you're thinking of right now that are dying to get that, you know, that person in. The more honest answer, I think, is that yes, there are those jobs. They just aren't advertised for. You don't get this advertisement that says, historian, please, we want critical thinking skills. But everyone wants those critical thinking skills. So stay here, get that skill set, do internships that enable you to network your way into a real career. So keep your eye on both of those things. Don't give up on your humanities education. It's crucial. We need more people who can think that way. But there's nothing wrong with having your toe in the, the practical side of things uh, by getting experiences that supplement the great critical thinking you're gaining in the history department. So don't just come to school and go to school. Come to school and do your internships and network and get out of, outside of, of just your classes to make things happen for you. Yes. Too, too many students, and it's not entirely their fault. We as academics have set them up and their parents, because they're thinking about a previous generation, thinking about a different way of doing things. They think that getting a degree opens doors. I like to tell my students, no, getting a degree is more like if you're gonna participate in a race, this is your registration. So now you get to be in the starting blocks. That doesn't mean you're getting a prize, but if you wanna be in the race, you need to register. That means getting a degree. Now your starting blocks relative to the finish line that's also up to you as to how close they are. The student who just gets a degree is the person in the far back. You better be able to sprint like no one's business. You better make you sing bolt, look like a slow poke. The student that has done multiple internships, that's published papers, that's been a part of clubs, that's really put their, you know, their neck out there and has been involved in things, that student's starting block are several yards, you know, if not tens of yards ahead of, of the other they're going to win the race. You've got to do those other things or your degree, it, 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 that's where your parents are right if they're telling you that it's a worthless degree. But I would argue that the business degree is only marginally more worthwhile if you're still just checked out and getting a degree. That is a really good point. I think you hear, you hear students from all majors that get to the end and can't find jobs. So mm -hmm. you can choose whatever you want to study as long as you're getting those experiences along the way. So I love that. Thank you for sharing all of that. Now with your podcast, I know you guys are, you have interns working for you right now, right? I do. So tell us a little bit about um, your intern program and maybe what your interns are doing for you and how they contribute and what skills does somebody working from an internship like that can they put on their resumes and help them post -graduate? Sure. So I think it's, first of all, I guess, important to understand the scope of history that doesn't suck. Uh, every other week, so you know, bi-weekly, uh, every other week, I put out an episode. Now, occasionally, that is an episode where I do a recap, but the typical episode is approximately 8,000 words of writing, and it contains usually just over a hundred footnotes to it. It's essentially a research paper. So uh, obviously the, the peer review process can slow down the publication of something by, by quite a, a lot. 
but you have uh, academics out there who pat themselves on the back for writing one such paper a year. I write these in my downtime every 14 days and then I record them and a sound designer puts sound effects and music over it and then I release that to the world. So I do that while being at an institution that has a 4-4 teaching load, mine's slightly reduced for uh, governance. So I teach a 3-3 load. Um, and sometimes my kids think that they should see me, you know, the, the personal life stuff is in there as well. So I, I have very little free time. Uh, I regularly am up uh, till one or 2 a.m. researching and writing. I need as much assistance as, as I can get. So in this process, as, uh, as I've produced well over half a million words of research, written, scripted podcast in the last three years, I initially had someone uh, who, well, initially was all by myself and I was dying. I was just running slightly faster than I could possibly keep up. I, I did bring in someone who served as uh, eventually some, something of a, essentially a, a co-author where I was, again, you know, head writer. I'd sign off on anything that was written. I was double checking the research. Um, and, and so we started kind of splitting the episodes. I'd write half, she'd, she'd write half. I'd verify I'm comfortable with what she's written. You know, basically peer reviewed it. And then I'd record the episode. And then when I was only writing, you know, about 10,000 words a month, well, I, I was able to sleep at night on occasion. So uh, I, I, th this was C.L. Salazar. I mean, her, her name is on the, on the website. Uh, love C.L. to death. She had a different career opportunity she, she felt the need to pursue. I wish her the best. But as she departed, I'm back to trying to crank out all of this on my own. So that's where I thought I'm, I'm going to try bringing in some, some interns who can do the, the, do the research. Now, CL did not start when she first came in, you know, actually writing some of the, the episode uh, in, in a given week. That was a trust that developed over time. Uh, so with no disrespect to my interns, I mean, that, that they're just brand new to it. CL also had a full-on bachelor's degree. None of my interns do. They're seeking bachelor's degrees. So as I bring them in, I have them in, in a research only <laughs> role, but it saves me immense time where I, as I'm working on, uh, first of all, I have them doing preliminary research. So they can come to me with source and say, okay, right now we're working on the transcontinental railroad. Here are, you know, basically I've done the historiography for you. These are these seminal works that you should be focused on. Thank you. I'm not wasting time in the library or online for, for hours. Um, basically I, I ask them to prepare an outline. Sometimes I follow their outline. Sometimes I don't. Uh, of course, I, you know, I make the decision at the end of the day as, as to what happens. And as the writing process goes on, I'll be tagging them with, with questions. We write it in a Google Doc. So, you know, I, I might say, all right, I am 90% sure on my statement here. I'm looking for a peer review. I want you to dig deep onto this and tell me if I'm right. They'll come back, you know, here are four sources backing up what you said. Actually, one person disagreed with you. And then, you know, th they can run down all of these side things that constantly come up when you're writing uh, essentially a research paper, and I just keep chugging along. So they're getting experience in uh, basically historical research. They're also seeing how to write in a, an engaging, you know, I, I don't write this like a, a history paper. And there is definitely a thesis statement. I state what things are, are going to be covered. Um, but basically, they're learning how to take their historical training and write for uh, TV shows, other podcasts. This is a growing field. Uh, and, you know, some of these interns, maybe they'll end up working for me after the fact or going through talk about networking. I have friends that run other major podcasts from Wondery to Airship. These are massive, you know, uh, companies. And it's entirely possible that they might find themselves being freelance writers for, for podcasts in the future. I went way too long on that one, Allison. I'm sorry. No, that was great. Um, I think that it sums it up really nicely how the description to the internship that you gave us was internships that don't suck. <laughs> so I love that. I think that the interns that get to come and work for you have great, will have great experiences and sounds like they're going to be adding some great things to their resumes and be able to help them in the future too. So is there anything else that you want to tell us about your podcast or anything that you just really love about your podcast or what you've been doing with that? Um, I guess the, the only thing I'll say is that it is, uh, it's really fulfilling to do your own thing. Um, and 
uh, I would say that when you're a history major, being willing to do your own thing, stop thinking about necessarily getting a PhD and getting the tenure track job. I'm not putting any of that down, but there are other things you can do. It's just that you're probably going to have to build it. So that's either you've networked your way to it, or it means starting something from the, from the ground, uh, you know, and building from the ground up. And when I started History That Doesn't Suck, it was definitely, you know, I mean, it's still a grind, but I was making this for no one to listen to, right? I was, I was telling stories into the void. Um, and it's now grown to become one of the most popular podcasts in the nation, but that doesn't happen overnight. So be patient with yourself and, and your goals. Okay, well, as we, I want to save some time for questions at the end, but I think you've given the students and anyone listening today just some really great advice and points and just, just letting them hear your story um, is inspiring to be able to know that people can take their own paths and start directing themselves and start um, making it happen for themselves just like you did. So I think that's really a neat thing for our students to hear. Is there any advice that you could just offer students who are now just feeling that fire a little bit and saying, okay, now I want to, I want to start forging my own path and I want to get there. And you know, what advice would you give them as they go along or what can you tell them? You're going to definitely experience these setbacks that you can hurdle over. So start doing it. Don't talk about it. A lot of people love to talk about the great things they're going to do in life. You've got to actually do it. And it's okay if it's small. It can be a very minor part-time, small little thing. You run your, your Instagram history page. Great. It's okay that there's 10 people on it and you post once a week. Just, just start. Two, forgive yourself. You're going to mess up. You're going to make errors. Um, that's uh, Historical errors are not really something I, I do. Uh, it has happened on very rare occasion. And I acknowledge them. I will tell my audience, here's a correction. It turns out that um, uh, there was a, a, a Civil War general. I just misspoke in, in recording. It was basically like a typo, but a misspoken. You know, it, there's just so many more instances where you can mess up when you not only have to write the thing, but then you got to read it. And uh, I, I turned this, Epis this Episcopal bishop into a Catholic bishop. Apparently in my brain, I wanted him to be Catholic. And of course, when you've got tens of thousands of listeners across the country, you know, you make any error like that. There's someone who's a total nerd on this one person. I get emails instantly if, if there's anything like that that's off. Uh, so, you know, it can be really frustrating where, you know, you, you might, if you're a bit of a perfectionist, you've got to make peace with the fact that sometimes, um, you know, things, things will not uh, always be perfect. Um, I would also say if you really succeed, you need to understand there are going to be people who don't like you. That, that was new to me. Uh, trolls are real on the internet and I'm, I'm not complaining. I have by and large great reviews and, and I am overwhelmed in, in kind things more so than, than angry things. But, um, I, you know, I, I have people who don't like, uh, someone told me my name is too disrespectful to history. Oh, I can't believe you, you refer to historical figures by their first name, how disrespectful, um, my favorite, uh, I'll, I'll do accents to try and offset different characters because I'm a single narrator. So my favorite was the, the person who said, uh, your French accent sucks. I guess the French history department should really take my degree back, or, uh, Fr the French department at BYU. Um, you, you know, some, somebody doesn't like something that you're doing and you've got to be comfortable in your own skin. And that comes, I used to, I'd get a, um, a, an email or a review that wasn't glowing and I brood and, and hurt and I take it really personally. And I think, oh my goodness, I, I, I'd be filled with self-doubt. And you just got to realize, no, it's, it's actually a sign that you, you're reaching a critical audience. Uh, if, if you're inundated with compliments and you're just getting a few haters, just keep going. You're fine. Okay. Those are my thoughts. I love it. So work hard, make it happen, start doing something and have confidence in yourself and give yourself a break. Maybe. Well, and, and I, I guess the one thing I'll add to that is if you do anything interesting in life, people are going to tell you you're, you're dumb. I had other academics, other tenure track historians, who I will not name, let me know what a stupid endeavor history that doesn't suck is. Because of course, I should be spending all of my time writing articles and books 
that are intended for 10 other people in my field. And, you know, it's just, just a waste of my training to be writing these very mundane, uh, you know, podcast episodes. How pedestrian. So you're, t- you're going where history is calling you to bridge there you that Yeah, it back in, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. So I love how you're confident in what you've done. I really, really just am impressed with the, the things that you've done and accomplished and being able to take things to the public and let them see the history like that, like the way you have. Well, Allison, you're kind and I appreciate it. I, I do have some decent confidence at this point. I will say though, uh, I, again, just to help those who are interested in doing something, I have been racked with self-doubt multiple times throughout this process. So I, I think a, an important thing here is to, to realize that when you look at where I'm at with history that doesn't suck today, you know, people are really good at looking at someone who succeeded and go, man, I wish I could have that. Gosh, things must've just worked out for that individual. There are terrifying nights and excessive amounts of self-doubt all along the way. The difference between people who end up where I'm at and, and those who, who don't, by and large, there are other factors. Some people will work very hard and luck will never break for them. But they've made peace with the fact that the world might just crap on them anyway. They're, they're, that's going to happen. That, that absolutely is the case. Um, and they've worked through the self-doubt. You know, I've, I've recorded ep- the very first episode I recorded, the preamble, as I call it, where I just stated what this podcast was going to be. I sat and looked at that microphone for, fi- I'm in, I was in this very room right here. I sat there and looked at my microphone for 15 minutes with my heart pounding on my chest. No one's here. Nobody's here. But I knew I was about to put this thing on the internet and who knows what happens when something's really out there. And it, I had to, after I'd already written this thing out, I had, to, I had to calm myself down and get into a space where I could even record it. And now, of course, I record these episodes and I throw my personality into it. Uh, and, and I feel good and confident. And someone wants to tell me that, you know, my, my whatever accent sucks or, you know, I, I don't like this sound effect. Um, I, I can now shrug it off. But this was a terrifying process to get to where that confidence was there. I worked through not having it. And I guess that is the point. It is a process, right? Keep there. I'm not trying to undermine your, your kindness. I, I just, I want people to understand that it's yeah. not like I'm, I'm someone who's like, yes, I can do this. I got this. I was terrified the whole way. And uh, one of my own personal philosophies, uh, I actually reevaluate what I'm doing with my life. If after a number of months, I realize I haven't been scared of something I'm doing. Now, that's not to say I need to go bungee jumping now, but what I mean is I recognize that fear professionally simply means I'm not getting outside my comfort zone. So I need to to pause and think, am I just in a rut now? It might be a really good rut, but what is it that I am afraid to do to get to the next next mile marker? And then I think it through and, you know, is is it a good fear? Maybe I shouldn't be doing it or am I just afraid because I'm human? And if it's the latter, then I let my heart finally calm down. I, I let myself have that human, you know, experience. And then I force myself to jump in and do it. Well, I love everything that you've said today. And I think that everyone has learned a lot from listening. And I know we have a bunch of questions. So I feel like we should maybe jump Absolutely. into our questions. Does that sound good? Mm-hmm. Okay, Lindsay, do you want to direct some of the students to um, ask their questions? Absolutely. So we have a question from James Good, and I believe Arnie is helping James to ask this question. We will invite him into our room. Come on in, James. <laughs> Looks like Arnie, you are on mute. Seeing that on anymore? Maybe let's go to the next one, Lindsay. Okay, the next one is from, well, actually, I have the question right here from James, and I can just ask it. 
What does Professor Jackson see as the needs in the history podcasting space? And how much research is required to put together one episode? Sure. Uh, the, the need, I would say, is really, it's the basics. You've got lots of people who are willing to do niche, uh, interesting little stories. They track down urban legends and that sort of thing. And then there are podcasts by academics for academics, and there's nothing wrong with that. But between uh, our increasingly online world and COVID exacerbating that, I can't tell you how many emails I get from parents that uh, tell me they're using my podcast as their curriculum because they're now homeschooling their kid. Or, and I got those emails from homeschoolers before COVID, but now I'm flooded with it. And I have people asking me for more resources, things that I can do to you know, further that. So I would say, you know, in many ways, this is going to be the future of education as much as that might sow trepidation in some people's hearts. Uh, th things that really help people understand the basics of the world and, and the nation in which they live, that's the need. How, how much work and effort goes into a single episode? Oh man, man hours, I would say is probably in the ballpark of uh, f at least 50 as high as 70 to make a one hour episode. Wow. I mean, you don't get to a hundred footnotes you know, without doing a lot of reading. So I'm, I am diving into just like, just as I would with, with a uh, peer reviewed article. I'm in the primary sources. I'm in the secondary sources. I am neck deep in all of it. By the time I'm done with an episode, I'm, I'd be ready to go to, I, I, I would say this, maybe some, some in the, in the department will be shaking their heads saying, I don't know if I agree with that. But I've gotten to a place where I can pick up the historiography very quickly and I could probably get into a conversation with the people who are experts on that field and hold my own um, you know, ra rather rapidly. You want to talk about Transcontinental Railroad? I can name the six you know, eminent historians working on that. And I can tell you where all the primary sources are for uh, everything from looking at the Irish, uh, Irish workers. Um, sadly, no real primary sources on uh, Chinese workers. Those do not survive. Uh, you know, to legislation, uh, you, you name it. So 50 to 60 hours of me researching and writing, another 10 hours or so just in sound production. Uh, my recording alone, that one hour episode, usually takes two and a half hours because I have to reread any sentence in which I make a mistake. And then Airship, which handles my sound design, has to go through and make it sound like I read that thing perfectly, flawlessly, without taking a breath. And then they add in the music and uh, you know sound effects. And then I don't even know how you account for the music uh, in terms of, yeah, we just add the, the, the scores in. But I and Lindsay over at, at Airship, we had to compose that music, right? We had to record that music. So that's a, a set thing, but you also need to account for the fact that there was time and effort on just producing it in the first place. I have James now. So James will allow you to talk. Oh, wow. Uh, Y'all can hear me? Yes. Oh, very good. Hey, Greg, uh, I'm, a, I'm a listener and a fan of your podcast and I really appreciate you. I'm, I'm, uh, I appreciate you answering my question. Uh, I'm doing my own master's degree right now. I live in Texas and uh, yeah, I appreciate you. Very cool. No, thank you. I, uh, I think I've seen you on Twitter a time or two, yeah? Yes, that's correct. Very nice. Okay, well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the, the Napoleon image. <laughs> okay, our next question is from Justin Martinez. If we could bring him in. Justin. Hey, Justin. Hey, how's it going? All right. So, as an as a graduate student and as a social studies teacher at an alternative school, it's evident to me, in conjunction with my experiences online and with our polarized partisan society, that there is. Uh, an extreme epidemic of, or in terms of a lack of critical thinking among the general populace. So how can we as educators or as humanities majors help to transcend that narrative? 
how can we help persuade others to develop their critical thinking as opposed to come from uh, a position of they're right from the get-go and therefore the other side is incorrect or wrong and rather go into it with a more extensive, thoughtful, considerate, critical thinking paradigm that will allow for better engagement as opposed to polemics. Justin, that's an excellent question. And I'm happy to tell you what I do. So first of all, in, in the classroom, I, uh, I, I make my students write 12 to 15 page term papers. And one of the things I do right at the beginning of the semester is I tell them, uh, I want you to come up with a question, not a thesis. You are not allowed to have a thesis yet. How the hell are you gonna write a thesis when you haven't done any research? You don't know what you're arguing. You think you might know, but you don't know. You have to actually do the research. Sorry, we're at BYU. I probably shouldn't have said how. But you've got to, uh, first of all, read the source material. So I set that as, as a baseline expectation, that no one speaks on things that they haven't done the homework on. And as they bring sources to me, I, I make them do this throughout the semester. I tell them the term paper is an ongoing process. I'm not going to let you just crank it out and, and write some terrible thing in the last week. I've been an undergrad. I know how that works. I handed in one term paper. I will now confess since I'm long away from BYU. While it was still hot from the printer um, and it was 30 seconds away from being late and sliding it under the door. So uh, I, I make, I evaluate their sources and this takes a lot of time. I think it's important to carve away even from content area teaching to make sure you're teaching good research because that's going to carry over into the other things that they do in life. Uh, they have to think about their sources very deeply. You know, I push back when they come to me with anything uh, that that isn't a good source. I, I don't think I need to go into details on what that would mean, given where you're at, you, you understand. And in class discussions, I'm always making a point to try and talk about both sides. For instance, uh, just today, right before this, I was teaching my Middle East course, and we started talking about the origins of uh, the, the state of Israel. So I'm talking before that. So that means discussing Zionism as, uh, as was... Uh, first of all, an idea, British support from it, and then discussing persecution that Jews are facing at large. But how does that jive with the indigenous you know, people already living in Palestine? So trying to make sure you are constantly putting both sides of something in front of your students. And it's something I try to do on the podcast as well. Uh, you know, some episodes really lend themselves to that, where I have great sources that I can actually share with the listeners. Episode three on the Boston Massacre comes to mind, where there are pain, painfully obvious propagandic British accounts and propagandic uh, patriot slash rebel accounts. And I'm able to put both of those, I can read that off to my listeners and a lot of them have to pause and go, oh my goodness, wow, this is, this is complicated. And the more we can do that, even if you're not talking about present day polemics, if you're, even if you're talking about historical moments, people, I get emails all the time from people saying, okay, I, I'm starting to realize how the sources I intake in terms of news have been affecting me as I see the way that you bring out the different sources on the podcast. So if you in the classroom make sure that you're giving your students both sides and forcing them to critically think, you're basically developing that muscle and they'll, it will come to bear when they're scrolling through their Twitter feed. Awesome, thank you so much for that. I really like when you said content teaching versus good research. I have tried to do that sometimes, but what I'm realizing is that I could be more consistent in that. Uh, there was a lesson where I taught my kids about isolationism versus uh, internationalism or, or international intervention, mm -hmm. uh, focusing on the early 1900s. And I used PragerU for the international intervention, and I used a more uh, left-leaning um, source to point to the problems with that. And so I really appreciate what you said, and uh, I'll definitely keep that in mind as I continue to teach my kids this school year. Fantastic. Thank you. Really great question. This next one is from someone who is caught in a library. And so she asked me to read it for her. This is from Cami. Cami's question is, what is your favorite episode of your podcast, whether it's the topic, the research, the recording, or even the response to it? Man, that's a hard one. Uh, Cami, I respect being stuck in a library just right there. 
I, the ones that come to mind for me immediately are uh, the cold open to episode 65. Uh, so not the whole episode, just that, the, just the first 10 minutes, I found <clears throat> um, an exchange of letters. Not, not that it was like, oh, you know, totally obscure, but I had the, the correspondence of uh, 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 General Sherman Kump. That's what his friends and family knew him as. That's how I like to refer to him. So um, Kump and his wife, and it, it was a as I was looking at their correspondences, I was able to see a way in which I could make basically a back and forth between the two of them by taking excerpts. And uh, then Ciel, who was still with me at the time, she she read um, the the letters written by Sherman's wife. I read General Sherman's. And it was this very intimate look into how um, how the Sherman family was suffering as, as he's out at, at the front. And so being able to bring that to life for my listeners. So it's not just, you know, this big, bold general leading the way, Union hero, the scourge of Georgia. Instead, you're seeing this, this man who's just suffered so greatly, this, this poor woman that's raising a, a, a slew of children. And then one of their babies in the correspondence, their newborn, who General Sherman hasn't even had the chance to meet, dies. So it's this... It, it, it's, it's pretty emotional. I, I really enjoyed that one. Uh, the Lincoln assassination is my, probably my favorite episode overall. Uh, the material was interesting um, and the, the sound design as well. It just really came together in an amazing way. Thank you so much for that. Tammy, if you have a follow-up, feel free to put that in the Q&A. Thank you for tuning in from the library. The next question we have is actually from Dr. Buckley here. Um, Arnie, can we invite Jay into this room to ask his question? I would love that. Dr. Jackson. Dr. Buckley. I appreciated you taking me on as one of your guests early on in your process. I appreciate you coming on. Um, Thank you, too, for developing internship possibilities for BYU undergraduates. We appreciate that. Um, one of my students, Taylor Tree, is working with you, so hope that works out well. Taylor is fantastic. She's working on the, I have three teams of interns, and they work on, on different episodes. Taylor's working on, on the one I'm writing right now. She's amazing. Perfect. What advice, besides being involved in Phi Alpha Theta and completing internships and other kinds of things, would you give us advice to students considering graduate school in history? I know that there's not always a job at the end of the rainbow. You mentioned that the skills are worthwhile for anything. Um, and what advice would you give to faculty when students ask them about going to grad school? I would suggest that the faculty and students alike be very real about what doors it does and doesn't open. So, have a real honest conversation with yourself about whether or not you wanna be an academic historian. If you do, I say don't shy away from that. Don't be scared by, by the, the lack of opportunities, go for it. But I'd also say be very realistic about it. Uh, burying yourself in tens, if not even, I've heard of some in the hundreds of thousands of student loans uh, for a PhD. Even if you get that tenure track job, you will live in poverty and you owe better to yourself than that. So uh, I would say look for programs that are, that are going to fund you. I know that there are different philosophies and that's perfectly fine. Uh, for me, and I realize there's bias there, for me it worked out to go to programs that either had very low tuition as BYU does or were willing to give me scholarships. I think I paid $500 in tuition for my master's program and um, because I took an entire four and a half years to finish my PhD instead of the four in which I was fully funded, I did have to buy three credits worth of, uh, of tuition at the U to submit my dissertation. So I, my entire graduate experience, I think I spent about $2,500 total on tuition. And that put me in a really good place uh, to be able to have a career that frankly is never going to pay you the way you know it should for the amount of education you've gotten. That's just the market. So you get a PhD in, in the hard sciences, 
faculty are paid more because of the competition in the private sector. History is never going to be able to do that. Um, so you, you need to be realistic in making sure that you're in a place that you can live in comfort on a salary that's, you know, maybe going to break into the triple digits towards the end of your career if uh, if you're lucky. Um, I, I I'd say that's probably that's probably it. I mean, look at look at the skill set that you already have. Is it being significantly augmented? And consider the cost of um, the opportunity cost that comes with going to that graduate program. Would there be another opportunity that you should pursue that would better open doors to, to what you're interested in? Perfect advice, thank you. My pleasure, good to, good to talk to you. Thank you too. Thank you for that. The next question is uh, anonymous. And the question is, if and when you get caught up to current events, will your podcast stop or will you start covering Current events? I have at this point, I mean, I, I'm not going to, if there's anything I've learned in life, I'm not going to cut myself off. Um, I, I reserve the right to do what I want at that point. But my current inclination is no, I will not cover current events. I think that it's important and good for historians to make connections to the past and the present. I also think there are um, too many historians that are willing to pass off their opinion on the present as uh, God's only truth because they happen to have a PhD. And uh, one of the things that is exacerbating, in my opinion, the polemics that uh, I believe Mr. Martinez mentioned is uh, our proclivity in this profession to really sound off on the present. And because of that, I am very turned off. Uh, people ask me all the time to do a special episode, for instance, with the the insurrection at the Capitol just last month. I was asked if I do a special episode. No, and it's, it's not because I don't think it's important. I think it's great that there are historians that do those things. I personally decided I don't, uh, I, I don't want to touch that stuff. I want, I, I want people to be able to see kind of a, a clean cutoff. So I presently have no intention to enter the 21st century. It's so funny, Justin Mark um, said, as. Dr. Ben Park has said historians are terrible prophets. <laughs> and, <laughs> and let me say, Ben is um, uh, Ben and I were at BYU together. Um, I, I we, we didn't get to become super close friends. We just didn't take the same classes. But I've always man crushed on him from afar, and he's been a great resource to me. Uh, he's one of those uh, those other historians I was thinking of earlier when I said those who make a real effort to talk to the public to, to engage. And, um, and yeah, I, I completely agree with him. Historians make terrible profits, but they think they make great profits. And I just, I hide my head in shame at this universal sin of my profession. So having no interest in adding the fuel to that, you know, dumpster fire, I have no inclination at this point to go beyond 9-11. Uh, that's, that's the latest I, I think I'm willing to go right now. From there, depending on what my listeners are interested in, I may do kind of more deep dives on American history. Basically, we'll call the, the podcast at that point, you know, the 200 level hit American history. And now we'll go to the three or 400 level. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I'm, I'm going to follow my, obviously, I, it's got to be something I'm interested in doing. But I, I do have a, a Patreon group. Uh, these are people who donate to keep the lights on for the podcast. Uh, th there's a few hundred of them at this point. And frankly, I, I feel like I need to at least have a dialogue with them and kind of say, hey, you guys are the ones that enabled me to do this. Where would you be interested in me going? And by the way, I'm not going into, you know, the, <laughs> the W. Bush and on the presidential. Right, administration. the most recent past, right. Exactly. I'll, I'll leave that to the journalists. Thing. <laughs> we have uh, one more question that just came in. That's another anonymous student who says, I focused a lot of my time just trying to figure out what I want to specify in within history. It sounds like this person loves history. How did you choose a specialty and what is the benefit of studying many different subjects in history? That is such a great question. So I chose my specialty, which I then um, semi-abandoned, with a very callous and cold heart. You're going to find that there are a lot of historians who, uh, in BYU, nothing but love for, for these former professors of mine, like half of them served a mission where they now are, you know, ex experts on. 
totally get it. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Um, for me, I was always thinking about what if this academic game doesn't work out? What if, it, what if I am one of the bodies left on the field trying to get into a tenure track gig? So with that and my own intellectual curiosity, I didn't pick something I hate. If you pick something you hate, you will never finish a dissertation. You've got to have at least an interest in it. But I, I knew I wanted to do something that would at least give me some foreign language. Uh, I am the weird Mormon who speaks a foreign language without Jesus telling him to do so. So I studied French at BYU, uh, picked up the language, and I decided I was going to focus on, on Europe. And I remember very cleanly, I was thinking, do I want to do France or Germany? Those are the two nations that were kind of drawing me in. And I looked at a map and I saw where French was spoken. And I saw where German was spoken. And I thought French is going to serve me a lot better. So it wasn't that I was just deathly in love with the French Revolution, couldn't imagine studying anything else. It's that I looked at the map and said, I have more job opportunities and practical use for this language than if I study something that's spoken essentially in Central Europe by a bunch of people who all speak English. So <laughs> um, there's someone studying German right now who hated my answer. I'm really sorry about that. We, we do need people to study it. But that was where I was coming from. Uh, and I then focused on French colonialism in North Africa because to me, in the, our present world, it was, I, I thought it'd be very valuable to have an expertise uh, in understanding where uh, modern day, uh, the modern Islamic world and the, and the West have uh, clashed or have worked together, just having a deep historical understanding of that. And, and so my, my dissertation turned into uh, a study of Islam in uh, early 20th century France. And I it was fascinated by my subject, okay? I'm not saying that it was completely cold, callous and cold-hearted, but I was also thinking uh, think tanks and maybe the State Department would be interested in me if I did that, as opposed to writing, you know, another dissertation on the Bayou Tapestry. And I think that that's such helpful because I think what we're finding with a lot of our history students right now anyway is they, they are multi-passionate. There are so many facets of history that they love. It's almost like, okay, well, why don't you try a couple on for a while and then let's see the things that stick. Well, and so I love that example. I would say at the undergrad, please just don't even, don't even tailor, tailor yourself. That's just ridiculous. Uh, no, don't. Try out all sorts of things. If there's a professor you're really bonding with, take her or his classes so that you have someone who can really write you strong letters of recommendation. But if you're applying to graduate school and you decide you want to do U.S. history and you took all these classes from someone whose expertise is China, it's fine. They're going to be able to speak to your intellect, your ability to write, your ability to research. It, it's no problem. It's okay. I, I didn't even stay within the same field. I did my master's in French studies. I left history for my master's degree because I really wanted to get the language down. And then I came back to history. I uh, you know, the, the French got a little, French department got a little snooty about it, but the his, historians were always cool with it. Um, yeah, the other thing I'll point out is that I now teach not in a history department, and I do teach European and, and Middle Eastern topics as is related to my dissertation, but History That Doesn't Suck is a U.S. history podcast. Stop putting blinders on yourself. The rest of the world is happy enough already to tell you to stay in your lane. Uh, feel free to branch out. And you answered the last question that just came in, you know, how did you make that connection from Europe to France to American history? I love that you said, I'm still playing in all these different fields. Well, and they inform what I do. The most recent episode I just did, uh, episode 83, is the first of my three episodes on the Transcontinental Railroad. And I think I came at it from a different angle because I have a deep understanding of Europe. Half of this episode is just explaining the invention of the locomotive in industrializing Britain. And with all due respect to my Americanist colleagues, I'm willing to bet I probably went a little deeper and gave a little more insight there than you know might, might have otherwise uh, been there. Just as of course, there are things they, they do better than me, right? They bring perspectives to Europe that, that, that I'd overlook. You're gonna be an individual as, as you keep going along and you know piece together all those things that, uh, that, that come to you. And one of the reasons I had the confidence, I'll add this, uh, to tackle U.S. history with history that doesn't suck. I thought about doing other subjects, um, but I had taken U.S. history as an undergrad. I'd taken a lot of it. Neil York, uh, I, I believe, has unfortunately passed. I think I heard through the grapevine. Yes, Dr. I York. Don't, I don't know. <laughs> okay, he, he, used to be, he used to be faculty at, in, in the department there. 
And he was an amazing uh, Revolutionary America historian. And he raked me over the coals. The only B plus, it's the lowest grade I ever got in a, in a history course, um, was from uh, Dr. York. He really just kicked me up a, a, another notch. And then as I did my PhD at the U, well, yes, I was working with a French historian, but they don't have a robust European uh, history program. So they kept assigning me as a teaching assistant to US history courses. And then I started adjuncting at Westminster because I had mouths to feed. I mean, I had kids and anything to bring in more money. Well, they needed US history uh, adjunct. I didn't look at my resume and think, well, I'm writing a dissertation on France, so I totally shouldn't apply. I looked at that and went, sure. I can, I, yeah, I TA'd for this. And look, if they want to hire me, then clearly I've got to be okay at it. And they hired me. And then UVU brought me on as an adjunct to teach US history courses. So by the time I got to, I got my PhD, I mean, I taught basic US history colonies of present more times than I could count. And there's nothing, nothing that gives you a crash course like having to actually articulate the material. Thank you so much. Those were all the questions, but I just wanted to do a couple shout outs. Some of your listeners are on today. Uh, Joe, and I'm, I'm not going to say the last name. No, Joe says, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, history teacher with a master's in history from Monmouth. Huge, huge fan and says, Professor Jackson has impacted my profession. My pedagogy and provided excitement in my classroom. Uh, well done. So just a shout out to Joe. Um, and then Justin is happy to take your book collection should you ever decide to go ebooks. So just a couple of those leftover thoughts for you. I will keep that in mind. Thank you. Well, we have had a great time today, great hour discussing this. I really feel like this is um, going to be great for our students to be able to get on in our archive even and see and just be able to, to look at this um, path that you've had, Dr. Jackson. So thank you for coming on today taking time to be with us, answering questions, and sharing your story with us. It's my absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the invite. Okay. We'll sign off for another month. Goodbye, everybody.